HR, how are you? I'm well. How are you, Sean? Doing all right. Uh, give me one second. I'm going to start the stream. Okay. Thank you. No worries. And I'm I'm going to make you co. You should be co-host. If you're not, I'm going to make you co-host because I got to step okay. out one second and see why my dog and see why my dog is upset. So <laughs> sounds good. Hi, Daniel. Thanks for joining the call. I'm going to pause this, the recording because if anything happens, we don't want to lose, um, you know, if the YouTube stream goes bad or something, we still have the recording and we can post that. Uh, right. Hey, Daniel. Hey, Tim. Participants here. Good morning. Our big co-host. Hello. Hey. Good morning. All right, Char and Tim, you guys are co-hosts. Um, I'm doing that mainly because we had problems with my internet yesterday, and uh, <laughs> I don't want to, like, you know, drop the entire stream or something. So right. if, anything happens, yeah. if anything happens to me and I disappear, this meeting is going to go forward. Uh, we are recording and we're live on YouTube, and y'all can take it away. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Sean. Yeah, sounds good. Thank you. Um, we'll give everyone just a minute or two to kind of trickle in before we uh, get going. Sounds good. Yeah, we, this week we're a little last minute with our speaker, but um, but we do have one lined up for our next meeting in two weeks, so we'll get the word out earlier, which will be good. Hi, Karim. Thanks for joining the call. Hey there. Yeah, uh, last time I couldn't join because we were in Spain uh, with ah. the team. But uh, yeah, happy to be here. Yeah, absolutely. I hope you had a good cool. time in Spain. That was pretty cool. Nice. We flew in the entire team. Wow, that's fun. Yeah, it's good to meet each other once in a while. Mm -hmm. Have remote workers, as you know. Right, right. <laughs> All right. Well, it is 8.02, so I'm just going to go ahead and, and kick us off here. Um, one second. All right. Uh, can everyone see my screen as we follow along here? Yes, looks great. All right. Sounds good. Well, yes, welcome everyone to the Identity Special Interest Group. Uh, and today is, what is it, May 18th. And today we will be doing a couple things, starting with uh, working group status updates, followed by a presentation on post quantum cryptography by uh, Vipin Baharathan. Um, so uh, I see, I think I saw him just come in. So welcome, Vipin. Uh, do you want to give us a quick introduction to your your talk today? Yeah, I mean, I would rather go straight into the talk when the time is ripe. I, I just, you know, created a short uh, set of slides for this, which I will share with the group um, after my talk. All right, sounds good. Um, well, as we usually do, we're going to start off with some working group updates from some other uh, groups working on open source uh, technologies. Uh, starting off, it looks like the Indie Contributors Working Group, uh, this is a future meeting, so it looks like they have not met since our last meeting, uh, unless anyone can correct me on that. Uh, yeah, we met uh, last week. Um, and yeah, I can give a, a brief update. We, um, on the Sovereign Node pipeline, the pipeline is in place updating documentation. So very close to done on that and excited to get that over the finish line. We also talked about the URSA end of life um, and the, the way that impacts Indy is that the BLS signatures portion will, um, will move into Indy with its Python wrapper. Um, and so the there's work happening on publishing um, 
the uh, on the publishing pipeline and updating the existing projects um, to switch over. We also had a presentation from Stephen Curran on tombstoning, which is high on the pri on the priority for the roadmap of Indy. And tombstoning refers to um, it's a mark associated with the transaction um, that means the transaction shouldn't be returned if it's requested in a um, for read access. And this is this is helpful when you have private or legal data on the ledger that should not be there, um, or if you want to remove access to transactions after a certain amount of time so that people don't use test networks um, longer than they should. And so, yeah, went over some past approaches and uh, some potential solutions. So that was that was interesting to hear about. And then we also went through and, and did a bunch of very satisfying cleanup on um, node and plenum repos closing PRs that uh, are no longer relevant. So lots of good progress there. Sounds good. Thank you, Char. <laughs> um, so it looks like the Hyperledger Aries group met just yesterday. Uh, was anyone able to attend the Aries working group meeting? Yes, I was. Um, the talk was mostly about what well, there was some some talk about did company do I believe, but um, the majority of the call was spent on um, uh, well the discussion around moving um, the Aries project to um, the Open Wallet Foundation. Um, that discussion was uh, <clears throat> that was not nearly finished at all, so um, that will probably continue next week. Uh, or no, it's on. It's actually on the agenda to uh, um, to finish it or to continue next week. But uh, that was what was discussed. All right, very interesting. Thank you, uh, Kareem. Uh, the Aries Bifold user group looks like they met on the ninth. Uh, was anyone able to attend that call and would like to summarize for us? All right. Uh, looks like they're doing some updating to NDVDR and uh, looking at a 2023 summit. Um, if you'd like more information, you can find the notes there. Uh, Aries Cloud Agent Python user group met on the 16th. Uh, was anyone able to attend this meeting that would like to summarize it for us? Yeah, I was there. I gave a brief update on the Anon creds update in Akapai project. So we're wrapping up the revocation work, which has just been a lot more complicated than expected, um, working on moving logic out of the old indie components and refining the new Anon creds admin API endpoints. And um, yeah, getting that wrapped up soon. And then also talked about the uh, webhooks issue that got fixed. Um, yeah, where you have the 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 Akapai mediator and Redis and instance versus tenant settings. All right, appreciate it, Char. Um, looks like Aries Framework JavaScript met on the eleventh. Uh, was anyone able to attend this session? Um. Yeah. Well, we actually met uh, two hours ago again. Oh. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. It's, uh... It's a busy day. Um, uh, today, the talk was mostly, uh, well, I uh, hosted a discussion on um, the future architecture of uh, of uh, Aries Framework JavaScript. Um, and this is half or partly related to the discussions that have been going on, um, uh, well, regarding um, <coughs> moving Aries to, um, to uh, the Open Wallet Foundation, but um, the discussion is mainly about okay, what do we, uh, because if you look at the structure of Aries Framework JavaScript, uh, what is uh, what lives inside the core package, what um, has its own package, um, uh, what is um, a separate module, um, <coughs> et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's a bit confusing, like um, we have moved away from Indy SDK, uh, so in the SDK has um, has been moved to its own package. Um, Ditcom um, uh, or uh, uh, sorry, Anoncreds uh, recently uh, that logic was moved to its own package, but then still in the core package uh, we have um, logic related to um, the uh, W3C credential format. So it was basically a discussion on okay, how do we how do we go forward, um, and what are the rules around. Um, um, yeah, 
where what code lives basically also to be continued hmm. no absolutely all right awesome appreciate it uh kareem cheers the uh, looks like a non-creds met on the 8th uh was anyone able to attend the hyperledger or non-creds meeting that would like to summarize it for us okay looks like there was updates to the v2 working group and some other fun things happening you can click the link later for full details uh trust over ip looks like they haven't met in a little bit to do uh, governance stack uh, i think we also met on the fourth but i'm not sure if we covered this governance stack uh toip meeting was anyone able to attend this session all right it looks like uh, they mainly looked at a db debrief from iw and then looking at the uh governance requirements task force this is older stuff it's march 16th uh, we've met since then uh, it looks like the diff interoperability group met on the 17th of may uh, was anyone able to attend this session All right. Uh, well, yeah, they have Zoom recordings that you can find here if you want to learn a little more about that. <clears throat> so that has not met. All right. And I believe that concludes our working group updates, unless anyone else has any last minute additions they'd like to add or interesting meetings that they sat on recently uh, that they'd like to tell the group about. Just, uh, um, I think we've announced this before, but on May 31st, there's an Anon Creds workshop. And I think there's a link at the top to register um, if you're interested. Oh, thanks, Sean. And then also in two weeks on this call, we will have um, another speaker will be joined by Wen Jin Chu, who will talk about the Open Wallet Foundation. So I hope you all are able to join us for that. Um, I had an announcement about the Anon Creds workshop and Char beat me to it. Um, so thanks for that. Um, joking. Um, <laughs> note to everybody, um, the community architects at Hyperledger, we have recently done um, contributor maintainer check-ins with the Fabric community. We are starting to do that with the Indie community and we're going to want to do it with the Aries community. One of the amazing things about open source is no one needs to ask permission to take this code and run with it. One of the frustrating things about being a community architect at Hyperledger is we don't know who's running with our code. Um, so we are working with some community members to identify teams out in the wild who are using Indy. Um, if you know folks who would like to talk about their experience with Aries, the Aries community, um, what they're doing, um, let me know on Discord. Um, we would love to talk to folks. Uh, this is an effort to make sure that we are checking in with the community and talking to folks. Um, also, third thing, and I'm, I'm going to put this into the wiki for the next uh, identity SIG call. Um, if you have news about Aries, let me know on Discord. Uh, we want to make sure that we are signal boosting all the amazing work that's coming out of the Indie and the Aries and the non creds community. So if, if you've got an implementation that's going live, if you've got a cool use case, if you're doing something, just let me know. Thanks, Char. Thanks, Tim. No, thank you. All right. I think uh, without further ado, we will hand it over to Vipin. Hold on. Okay. I probably should share my screen because I have a little presentation here. Uh, are you able to see the screen? Yep. I hope so. Looks good. All right. Um, so the agenda is very simply, why post-quantum cryptography? 
This is occasioned by the publication of NIST 1800-38A. If those numbers don't make sense to you, they don't make sense to me either, but we know that of that series, this is only the first document, 38A implies that. And it is open for commons, and it's a very, very simple document. Uh, it's essentially an executive su su summary of what whatever has been going on. There are a number of um, candidates for PQC, but uh, they are all stuck uh, with, with in, in commons and various other um, activities inside NIST. And NIST, as you know, National Institute of uh, Science and Technology um, will be the ones to spearhead this move for the United States. And some people, of course, are suspicious of NIST because they think uh, some of the algorithms um, <clears throat> have deliberate or uh, otherwise backdoors. But uh, uh, we, this is what we have today other than the commercial enterprises. And once it comes out of NIST, it will be adopted by everybody. Then the third one will be uh, a look at the applicability of this particular, uh, this particular document or this particular set of guidelines to our identity solutions and the next steps according to NIST. Um, so, What's, why PQC, why post-quantum computing? Advances, uh, as we all know, with the quantum hype, uh, advances will break existing algorithms. That includes uh, all, all the algorithms that are currently in use across, uh, you know, a lot of, a uh, lot of the um, ecosystem and a lot of use in various applications, including banking, including TLS, including, so basically all network libraries, all, <laughs> I mean, all uh, cryptographic libraries, all network interactions and all wallets, everything. Um, but is this hype or is this real? I mean, you know, this is the other problem because we have been hearing about uh, QC for breaking uh, the factoring, huge numbers uh, is still far away because of a couple of limitations of quantum computing. One is that you need enormous amounts of error correction circuits for this, a particular use case, and we are still in the 200, 300 qubit state, which is not enough with millions of error cor correcting circuits. So is it still an engineering problem or a physics problem? Meaning it is, is it much more basic, like it's not going to happen because it breaks certain uh, fundamental laws of physics, or is it an engineering problem? Well, it appears that many people think it is an engineering problem, but it's a very, very hard engineering problem, only solvable by uh, probably state actors in the beginning, and then uh, later on big companies. And it's not going to be released into the open, at least in the beginning. In the next 10 to 20 years, who knows? So the, prob the point is that since, uh, since any large scale um, deployment of PQC will need a long lead time because we have observed that in other algorithms, it takes about eight to 10 years for uh, libraries, tools, methods, processes. So it's not, it's not gonna to happen tomorrow, even if it, it may happen, but 
so I have read uh, from both extremes of the debate, uh, meaning people saying it's possible to create something that will break RSA, and some people saying it's never going to be possible, at least not with a lot, you know, the scale of quantum computing needed uh, because of the um, physics problems. Anyway, the list 1838A is basically an executive summary. Uh, the new algorithms, of course, uh, there are several candidates already proposed. They need to be resistant to both classical and quantum computers. It is not going to be a drop in re replacement because there are differences in uh, you know, various aspects, um, which means that serious engineering has to take place in order to uh, put these uh, new algorithms into context. And the new algorithms are not mature enough. They have several problems with um, speed, with the setting up, you know, all the, all the steps mentioned here. Um, so there may be uh, multiple touch points within every app. Um, usually the application programming people do not have control over the algorithms because it's always uh, sourced from the outside and then maybe coded up, but uh, you know, usually it, it's, it should be, for us anyway, it should be uh, more of a process. First, a survey, uh, identify where and how public key algorithms are used in a non-creds, indie, Aries, DICOM, everything else. Uh, and here is an important uh, piece of information, dangers due to store and break, that means all the encrypted traffic or significant en encrypted traffic can be stored uh, somewhere and broken at a later time. So if that traffic is not important, let's say 20 years down the line, then uh, you know it doesn't matter. But if it is, then it's a possibility that it could be broken then and used for other purposes. Um, so they are going to produce a set of tools uh, into identifying the quantum vulnerable algorithms for these three uh, types of uh, code bases, cryptographic libraries, network, uh, network uh, you know, transport layer security, uh, and applications like every application, including wallets, everything else. So maybe we can even do a simple, you know, uh, identification of what I used in these, in our set of libraries or uh, things under the hyperledger umbrella, just to prepare. So the next step is uh, release of 1830 8B and 1838C. B is going to be for more for um, program managers and uh, C is mostly for IT professionals, which means people who are deploying the algorithm. Um, initial interoperability and performance testing will cover all these various things that I've mentioned here, including HSMs, which uh, should uh, send uh, a shiver down the spines of most people who rely on HSMs for any kind of security. So these are the references, any questions you can ask me and I will try to answer if I can. My exposure to cryptography is long, but not deep. But, you know, I did write 
um, a, a seed function for initial versions of the Audible player, which has a patent. Unfortunately, they have the patent, uh, but uh, you know that's my introduction to cryptography maybe back in the 90s. Uh, and the algorithm I came up with, uh, or the process rather, and the way in which it was implemented in software uh, did, uh, let's say, uh, uh, gain the approval of many uh, wise cryptographers uh, of which I don't claim to be one. Um, then later on, I've also worked with the ZKP's um, uh, standardization effects. Uh, and as a um, chair of the identity working group earlier, had, I had um, multiple people speaking on this topic and I have engaged with them uh, mostly on, the, on my own level, which is obviously not as deep as a mathematical uh, cryptographer developing new algorithms. Um, that's about it. And I'm stopping the share and you can ask me any questions and I would be glad to answer any that I can. That was really interesting. Thank you for for presenting, do you, um, do you know how an algorithm is determined to be quantum vulnerable? Well, it is uh, mostly based on um, the fact that if it, if it uh, involves factoring huge numbers, then it's vulnerable. Mm -hmm. If it's not like lattice cryptography, certain, I mean, there there's a whole bunch of uh, ways in which you know, that it is, I mean, for example, hashing functions are still resistant to quantum. Mm -hmm. uh, meaning if I have a hash, significantly large hash, it would be, uh, so what, what is the attack? The attack is to produce another, um, Another, you know, let's say uh, string that would hash to the same value, which is not the original string, original uh, uh, set of binaries, whatever, a book, the whole complete works of Shakespeare, anything mm -hmm. uh, is a string. So that is resistant. So Merkle trees probably are resistant, but most of the signature algorithms and the Diffie-Hellman stuff and the, you know, session key, like establishment. Uh, I don't know about the symmetric keys algorithm, but I would assume they are too, but uh, mostly it's the asymmetric key, the private public key type algorithms that are vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Thank you. All right. Uh, quick, quick, quick. Any, anybody? This yeah. is Tim Bloomfield. Here's a quick question on the. I, I will. I'll read. I'll read the um, NIST article. I, I haven't read that, but any talk there about um, zero knowledge proof post quantum um, algorithms? Uh, I haven't seen that because there is a. There are a bunch of candidates. Uh, that have been proposed since 2016, 2017. I haven't seen anything to do with the, uh, well, because zero knowledge also, you know, is heavily dependent on hashing. So in a sense, there may be some uh, inbuilt uh, protections, uh, but I, ha I haven't looked at the details of that. And anyway, like I said, I'm not exactly qualified, but uh, just a interested uh, amateur with uh, long exposure to this stuff. Thank you. Uh, anybody else? Uh, 
I was curious. So it sounds like you've read about the extremes of the opinions about what this will mean for the world. Where do you land on that? What do you think about the possibility or impossibility of quantum computing breaking many of our current alg alg algorithms? Impossible. Mm. Well, only because, you know, at scale, interference is a problem. Right? If you have multiple quantum qubits, um, then I mean, right now most of the uh, most of the quantum computing is done in very specialized labs at very low temperatures. There are guys who have claimed to have uh, done stuff, uh, uh, you know, in the let's say. Um, at, at normal temperatures. Otherwise, mm -hmm. you have to go to absolute zero somewhere around there, you know, in order for most of this to work. But there have been some advances, and there, of course, have been uh, multiple claims of quantum supremacy, um, but mostly debunked uh, on serious um, quantum uh, computing sites and blogs hmm. from professors. So, I mean, it is possible to do some quantum computing for doing uh, things like optimization problems, quantum annealing, for example, you know, which is basically trying to find a minimum or maxima, local or global, uh, or, you know, th those kind of problems which are basically um, uh, basically very useful. I mean, very useful, um, but factoring is another game. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's why it requires, uh, you know, of course, nobody is going to come and say, oh, don't do it because we have seen those predictions uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> fail a lot, uh, you know, in the past, but there are also predictions which, uh, which, uh, you know, the sun is not going to rise uh, in the West in my lifetime, um, for example. So mm -hmm. there are some extreme predictions that you can make, but um, there's all kinds of uh, extinction events. Uh, um, waiting for us, including AI mm -hmm. uh, and everything else. So there are people making predictions about, you know, all carbon life forms are going to be wiped out in 20 years, which I don't think is going to happen. But hey, mm -hmm. I'm just a carbon life form <laughs> trying, to, <laughs> trying to be positive. Right. Yeah, interesting. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. We'll so, follow this up uh, with the, so, sorry, Karim, so go ahead. Oh, no problem. Uh, yeah, so I don't know if you uh, mentioned this, I was uh, briefly going in between because there was someone at my door, but um, one thing I'd like, I'm asking, or I'm wondering about, um, and my knowledge is not too, uh, uh, too, too, too good to, <laughs> to answer that myself is, um, so, like right now we're using all kinds of uh, cryptography um, um, to encrypt stuff in our wallet and and, and in our storage, uh, which, uh, as I understand it correctly, uh, some of those those algorithms um, can potentially uh, break uh, or be broken when uh, when quantum computing um, um, is a little further ahead. So, like, would we? Um, is it possible? to sort of uh, re-encrypt <clears throat> your wallet in order to, to protect against those kinds of future threats? Or uh, would this, for instance, mean that we would have to start with a completely fresh wallet and um, like as soon as we have those algorithms that are quantum um, or post-quantum, um, um, should we like start over uh, in a sense? Yeah, I mean, this is a very serious topic uh, uh, under discussion by various people. 
uh, of course, they have been discussing mostly on on um, things like, um, you know, because the UTXO set in Bitcoin, for example, um, is forever. So you cannot, you know, uh, so how do you transition? How do you uh, make the leap, uh, uh, starting to protect some of the most vulnerable parts? Um, so some of the ideas that are contained in carry, for example, uh, key rotation, uh, which shouldn't be just key rotation, it could be method rotation too, right? I mean, because you can't just, I mean, it's, it's against key compromises, but, um, but now you'll have to change the method too to PQC. In the case of wallets, I think the action can be quite rapid, like you said, meaning, but you have to have a plan. You have to have a way of uh, looking at it very carefully and saying, how do you migrate? And, and this, uh, this is the aim of this talk to at least take a look, right? So that we can say, okay, if PQC becomes a reality, meaning you know there are some standard uh, tractable algorithms, meaning something that does not consume your whole computer or is not incredibly difficult to set up, which, which, uh, you know, which is an engineering problem, right? I mean, once you have the PQC and once you have uh, uh, a bunch of very serious uh, companies. In fact, there is a list in that publication. It is like uh, the who's who of uh, you know, all the big corporations, Microsoft, Google, you know, Alphabet, uh, Amazon, blah, blah, blah. So they have tremendous resources. So they will, uh, somebody is going to come up with the library and as far as we are concerned, we'll just have to be concentrating on the process. That means identifying the weakness right now and then trying to, let's say, get it uh, into a transition state. Um, I think uh, Dr. Stornetta, uh, who's, one of the two uh, authors who uh, quoted multiple times on, on um, I think thrice on, in Nakamoto's uh, Bitcoin paper uh, has proposed some ways to, um, to go forward, meaning, you know, replace algorithms, replace certain, key things and migrate. It, it will probably be a hard fork of some sort. Um, uh, and uh, the problem is the signatures um, backing the UTXO, how will that be uh, handled? But for the wallet, like, like you said, that may be easier. Yeah, so another thing I was just thinking about is because I mean the wallet partly, right? Um, is just has credentials and um, and all that kind of stuff. But um, an another interesting thing I think would be how to deal. And I don't think this is a problem we have right now um, at this point. But let's say you have like long lasting uh, Didcom relationships um, with mm -hmm. a certain party. Like uh, how? Because I mean the whole point, the whole thing that. That 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 enables building of the yeah the building of trust over a Didcom connection are the keys in the end, um, and it's like how would you is is it possible? I have no idea. It's just a, an open question here. But like, would it be? Can, can we think of something to to indeed well basically rotate the key, but also the key method, and still maintain that trust relationship or? Would we like need to create a new connection and somehow, and I think that's that's pretty doable, uh, transfer that trust from 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 one connection over to the other? Uh, random thought, but uh, interesting, very interesting. 
Well, ultimately, it is it is a method. Uh, you know, it is methods for transferring trust. Um, maybe it has to be a one-way street in the sense that uh, you know um, you can't do it twice. The same thing, meaning you know, obviously, once you say, okay, this is the method is now transformed into a PQC. You shouldn't be able to go back and say, oh, I want to do it again, because then you're not sure, especially after the passage of time, that the second is, you know, it, this is all going to be based on trust anyway, uh, in, a, in a certain sense, but we have to leave a very few openings or gaps for uh, misuse. Um, so, you know, I think there's a lot of people thinking about this stuff, about transitioning, how do you change basic cryptographic, um, the armature, the, you know, I mean, basically you're changing the engine of the car as the car is running, sort of. Uh, so we have to have a way of doing it. And I, I'm sure, you know, this is also uh, in the realm of engineering problems. Uh, you had something else to say, Karim? No, I just love that analogy, like of a <laughs> changing the engine of a running car. That's uh, that's exactly what it is. Well, I mean, it's simply, simply put, but uh, yeah, uh, I think. Um, I think there, you know, there are going to be some interesting uh, developments, uh, but I may not live to see them. So, is there a good question to to all of us? Like, is there actually a, sort of a, a working group, or not? Well, I guess it's too soon for a task force, but. Like, um, I know there is a lot of people looking at, at migration, but like in Aries or Hyperledger um, specific, like, is there, is, are there people working on this? And how do we, uh, yeah, it's like, what are possible approaches to migrating? Um, is it too soon to do that? Is it too early or? Well, the, there is that whole forward key thing, thinking you know, that is, in both, I, I think Kerry has got that, but there is no formal working group uh, or any kind of, I think unless unless we get the tools to, uh, to start even scanning the code for a QV that is quantum vulnerable uh, algorithms, um, you know, we, we can't really make you know, make headway. But the um, NIST team is uh, going to publish a lot of material, including, you know, processes and ways in which uh, this uh, switch can happen. And maybe it's time to at least, I mean, I could, uh, you know, write up a blog or something about this, and then we see how it develops. Yeah, yeah. It's just that I like I've heard this <laughs> this term uh, around, but I don't think like the, there is this awareness is big enough. Uh, and then again, like it, it also depends on how how soon <laughs> this th becomes a real threat. But uh, as we've seen with AI, uh, things can go very rapidly all at once so yeah i mean the the techniques for developing uh, chat gpt 4 and 5 uh, were around 10 years ago but uh, similar techniques for uh, for quantum uh, scaling or factoring doesn't seem to be around I, I don't know i mean i may be looking in the wrong place uh, but not everything is the same, right? I mean, meaning, you know, just pointing to past 
the rapidity in development in one field does not give you clue to rapidity in another field, I feel, because, you know, people always bring up, you know, various analogies. Analogy is great, except when it's not. <laughs> anyway, uh, Daniel, I, I, you might, are you working on something similar or something to do with this stuff? Mr. Backenheimer? Or is he just hanging out? Uh, anyway, I will uh, follow up maybe later with some thoughts on this. And Sean can help me. Thank you very much. This was uh, very interesting. Yeah, really interesting discussion and presentation. Thank you. All right. Uh, yeah, uh, we didn't discuss much about the transition to the new SIG and how, what it means. I, I, I don't know. Did you, Char? Char, sorry. <laughs> no worries. Um, yeah. We talked about that a bit. Uh, on the meeting two weeks ago, but um, we can definitely talk more about it. That was mainly just an announcement and brief overview of of the merge, but um, we can we have time if if we want to keep talking about that. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the two arms of the uh, identity fig, one being the um, kind of a strategic uh, forward looking and surveying uh, on a broader field survey and broader field concerns um, versus the uh, detail oriented work in the implementers group. Um, both are necessary, I feel, but uh, the other one has kind of lapsed a little bit because some of it is just seen as uh, just talk uh, and not enough action. Um, so hopefully there will be a good uh, uh, sort of synergy between these two activities and uh, getting uh, the next week's speaker, the next uh, uh, two weeks away speaker is part of a strategic sort of look uh, at things. I hope uh, he will he will do that. And uh, that's about it. We had some fantastic talks in the working group earlier, but it has sort of fallen by the wayside because uh, a lot of people are just more interested in uh, doing things and uh, getting involved in the details. Over. And uh, Vipin, just so you know, Shar and I are talking about um, videos from previous identity implementers calls uh, that we want to put onto the Identity SIG YouTube. So if you've got um, any demos or or WG calls that you thought were great, let me know. I will grab I will try to find and grab those videos off the wiki and uh put them up on the YouTube as well. There is one by Kim Kim Cameron who's uh passed away, unfortunately. I can find that, yeah. Yeah, that is a very visionary uh, uh talk. And that was done just weeks before he did past and Kim has been a very influential person in this space for many many years before it became uh, fashionable I suppose uh, so that's one at least and then there is a talk by <clears throat> Sam uh, doctor uh, you, you know on Carrie I think his name is Smith, Sam Smith. Uh, 
Yeah, Sam Smith uh, is the person working on Carrie, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So there is a talk by him, maybe two years ago. There are all kinds of bits and bobs all around. Uh, many of them uh, are talk, talk about the early days uh, are on the um, identity methods inside um, all of the, uh, you know, things like Hyperledger Fabric, CA, Hyperledger, um, you know, Hyperledger Sawtooth, um, and various other, um, other platforms that we host. Uh, we had surveys of their existing uh, identity solutions. Which, which are important. And then there was an attempt at a paper, which we hope to revive. It is more of a survey. Uh, there is a paper by, uh, there is a talk by people in uh, uh, GLIFE, uh, the uh, Global Legal Entity Identity Foundation, um, which yeah, legal entity identifier, right? Yes. Um, so uh, that's yeah. 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 They, there was a talk on that. Right, because they're using carry and uh, ACDC and stuff. Yep. Yeah, but that's now, uh, but when they gave the talk, it was just when they were stepping into the, into that. Oh, area. gotcha, okay. I Because more recently, I thought they presented, maybe it was just a trust over IP, like um, their kind of updated trust registry and stuff like that. Um, yeah, that, that explained how they're using carry and ACDC, the chain credentials. Yeah, uh, but they do support, you know, huge num um, number of uh, enterprises today. I don't think they use these methods today. I, I, I'm not sure. Right, you're right. They 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 do su uh, support a lot of different ones, and I believe it was um, in one use case where they um, where they use the um, uh, carry, um, but but only because the um, there was no, uh, I think that was the case where there was no other, you know, layer one utility uh, available, um, if, you know, for a trust registry where they use chain credentials uh, in, instead of, I think that was the deal. Yeah, I mean, they, um, I think that it's, um, FATF is requiring adoption of LEI. Um, and as, as such, I think a lot more people outside the United States are using that. Uh, and there may be any, a, a legal uh, requirement to go to LEI um, by the UN agencies and so on. Uh, anyway, that, the, the, that's another talk which at least for historical reasons, it should be uh, important, but not just for historical reasons, because I think 80 to 90% of that stuff is being, uh, being, uh, uh, you know, being used today. The two things that are there, which are very important are, one is the uh, governance, uh, legal governance documents that are attached to the enterprises. Uh, the other one is to discover um, all the subsidiaries. So if you have one corporation, then all these hundreds and thousands of other corporations under it, subsidi subsidiaries of subsidiaries and so on. Uh, that's very key. Um, and the jurisdictional documents are very key. 
these are an extension of the uh, identity, uh, let's say identity space in a, in a sense. And then it goes into things like beneficial ownership, which is a very hot topic. Um, so for all those reasons, uh, LEI and Glyph is very important. Yeah, it would be great to dedicate um, some calls to inviting speakers from those realms to talk about it. Are you still in touch with Carla uh, McKenna, Daniel? Was that a question for Daniel? Yeah, yeah, I mean. Yep, yeah, it, it has, yes. Um, uh, not of late, but yes. Um, uh, I just saw his colleague, or her colleague last week in uh, uh, in Berlin, but um, yeah, Carla, uh, it's been a while, but yeah, happy to reach out. And that was that, Mr. Schneider. Yeah. Okay. An Andreas, right? Yeah, Schneider. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I, I have both their contacts, and I haven't talked to them in a long time, but. Yeah, Andreas. I, yeah, I was talking with just last week. Okay, beautiful. Thank you. All right, that's that's all from from my end. <laughs> I think I've talked enough. Yeah, thank you. I I agree about um, having both the the high level overview and strategic forward thinking and the detail oriented low level view as well. I think both are really beneficial and it's wonderful that we've merged and we'll have both of them on this call. So, but yeah, I'll, I'll turn it over to Tim to um, <laughs> close out the call. No, absolutely. Thank you, Char. Um, yeah, that will be all from us. Quick reminders on just the upcoming things. One last time will be uh, the Anon Codes Workshop, May 31st, registration link is on the wiki, so be sure to check that out. And our uh, next uh, speaker will be Wang Jing Chu from the Open Wallet Foundation, and that will be on the 1st of next month, so June 1st. So be sure to come back for that. Uh, other than that, I appreciate everyone uh, turning up and the excellent conversation that was had, and uh, we will see you in a couple weeks. Have a good one. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Pippin. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye.